Hey everyone, CJ here. Welcome to the episode 0 of the Tang Dynasty series. The Tang Dynasty is the second golden age of China, after the Han Dynasty. It is a period when Chinese cultural development reached its greatest height and it became the cosmopolitan center of the eastern half of the world. But before we go into Tang, it is really important to understand the context of its rise and the significant role the nomadic tribes to the north had in shaping the political and cultural landscape. So without further ado, let's dive into the wars and bloodbath that happened between the collapse of the Han Dynasty and the rise of Tang. Throughout most of Han Dynasty's existence, it was under the constant threat of the nomadic empire to the north, the Xiongnu Empire. The power balance between these two empires seesawed like kids on sugar rush. But finally, the Han Dynasty emerged victorious. To be honest, the Xiongnu's defeat is more of a nomadic empire problem rather than Han Dynasty's prowess due to their propensity of getting into succession wars and splitting apart. But of course, I'm talking about this in relative terms because the Chinese was only slightly behind them. At the end of the second century, the Han Dynasty was severely destabilized by corruption and eunuch-led factionalism. Until eventually, famous warlords such as Cao Cao, Liu Bei, and the Sun family carved up the Han Dynasty into three. The twilight of the Han Dynasty and the Three Kingdoms era was a bloody but exciting period when many heroes rose and became immortalized in folk tales, operas, and the epic novel Romance of the Three Kingdoms. But spoilers, spoilers, it ended with a major upset when the Jing Dynasty, as if appearing out of nowhere, usurped the kingdom of Cao Wei and unified China. The Jing Dynasty didn't have it all figured out either, and it lasted for only about one and a half century. Throughout most of its existence, it only managed to clung onto the southern part of China. The period between Jing and Sui was very messy. And to make all this information more manageable, I think it would benefit everyone if I divide the political scene into two blocks, northern and southern China. All of this mess started in 291, when the Jing Dynasty was caught in a very bloody civil war called the War of the Eight Princes, when members of the royal family fought over the control of a developmentally challenged emperor. To secure victory, various factions started bringing in nomadic tribes from the empire's borders to bolster their forces. And was it a good idea? Well, the name of the event that ensued certainly didn't make it sound like one. The uprising of the five barbarians happened when the nomadic people they invited in, Xiongnu, Di, Jie, Chang, started to develop their own ambition for the imperial throne. They established their own kingdoms and turned on the Jing dynasty. The Xianbei were initially on the Jing side, but they eventually got into the game too. Thus, the northern part of the Jing empire was carved up, and their royal family were forced to move their capital southwards to Jiankang, which is the city of Nanjing today. Here we enter the chaotic 16 kingdoms period, which really just took place in the northern part of China. Various kingdoms ruled by nomadic tribes rose and fall very quickly, like a bloody game of whack-a-mole. Except that it is the mole that's doing the whacking. Meanwhile, the remnants of the Jing could only bunker down as they watched the carnage unfold up north. To get a better idea of what's happening up there, let me profile the tribes one by one. The Xiongnu of this time period were the descendants of the southern Xiongnu. After the defeat of the northern Xiongnu in the first century and their westward migration, the southern Xiongnu were resettled in northern China by the Han Dynasty where they became little more than pawns of war, mercenaries that were to be called into war at the convenience of various succeeding political powers up to the Jing dynasty. Fed up with the demeaning treatment, they were one of the first ones to establish a kingdom, 
Citing the ancient marriage alliance the Xiongnu had with the Han dynasty 500 years ago, the Xiongnu leader Liu Yuan claimed to be a descendant of the Han royal family and established a kingdom called Han in 304. It was later called Han Zhao by historians to distinguish it. But I must remind everyone that these groups were not a cultural and linguistic monolith. They were more of a confederation of various different people groups because living among them were the Jie people who would eventually broke away and conquer Han Zhao. But don't worry, the Xiongnu were not out of the game yet, and they will pop up again later in the timeline. Just having similar culture didn't mean that they will work together either. Different clans of the Xianbei formed different kingdoms. The Murong Xianbei established the former Yan, and the Tuoba Xianbei established Da. The Xianbei was a splinter group of the Donghu Confederacy. The split was caused by their defeat at the hands of the famous Xiongnu leader Modu San Yu 500 years ago. These two kingdoms will fall, but watch out for the Tuoba, because they will rise again and surprise everyone. The Ti people were originally from the area to the south of the Gansu region. They established a few different kingdoms throughout the 16 kingdoms period. Their most successful empire was the former Qin. For a moment, they controlled the whole of northern China. But after a disastrous defeat against the Qing at the Battle of Fei River, the empire crumbled into a collection of disparate states again. And this is where the Qiang made their political appearance and established the kingdom of later Qin. The term Qiang had been mentioned in Chinese history since the Sang Dynasty, 2,500 years from that period. But these Qiang people were probably not the same as those ancient people. The Qiang of this period were likely to be the ancestors of the Tibetan and the modern Qiang people. The Tuoba clan of the Xianbei also rebuilt their kingdom under a different name. And their kingdom, the Northern Wei, ended up conquering all the northern kingdoms in 439. And by doing so, they ended the 16 kingdoms period. Now we are in the northern and southern dynasties period, where the political division is easier to understand. If you look at the map, you will notice that the Qing dynasty to the south had turned into the Liu Song dynasty. The difference between the north and south is that the southerners were more civilized. They don't do breakaways like those northern barbarians do. Uh-uh. They just stab each other in the back and usurp the throne in one piece. This north-south division happened several times throughout Chinese history. Each time it happened, it further deepened the cultural division of northern and southern China. In dynastic China, there was a stereotype that the northerners were better horsemen and the southerners were better boatsmen. This kind of stereotype prevails until today with Northern Chinese often stereotyped as bold, brash, and honest, while the Southerners are soft, cultured, and shrewd. With the massive amount of refugees migrating to the South, the Southern dynasties became the cultural center of the era, and many poems were produced there. Meanwhile, Northern Wei was notable to be the setting for the Ballad of Mulan. Their victory over the Roran Kakanet probably inspired the ballad itself. But the ones who eventually finished off the Rorans were the Gokturks, who would overthrow them from within and absorb them into their own empire in the 6th century. Meanwhile, something interesting happened in Northern Wei in 493. Their ruler, Emperor Xiaowen, moved his capital to Luoyang and decided to sinicize his empire en masse to make it easier to govern and probably to legitimize his conquest of southern China. He ordered his subjects to change their surname to Han surnames and even change his own surname from Tuoba to Yuan and married off many of the Wei noble women to the male members of the southern royal families that had defected to their side. His grandmother, Empress Dowager Feng, who was of Han Chinese descent, probably influenced him too. This move was met with some resistance, of course. Even his own crown prince tried to depose him, but he survived the plot. 
eventually Northern Wei split up again into Eastern and Western Wei due to a power struggle. They were then backstabbed into the Northern Zhou and Northern Qi. So were the Southern dynasties into Chen, with the previous Liang dynasty pushed into a small corner in central China. And here we are, close to the rise of the Sui dynasty and the end of this roller coaster ride of uprising and hidden daggers. Yang Jian, the man who would be the first emperor of the Sui dynasty, was an accomplished military leader under the Northern Zhou dynasty. He participated in the conquest of Northern Qi and was also the father in law of the emperor. In short, he was very influential in court, and that made him a prime target of suspicion. After the death of the emperor, he was appointed as the regent of the new emperor by his friends. Some people didn't like that, of course. After they tried to assassinate him a few times, their fears actually turned into reality as Yang Jin ended up deposing the new emperor and established the Sui dynasty to assert control. They would then proceed to conquer the southern dynasties and unite China under one rule once again. Various ancient Chinese historians and important figures considers him to be one of the best emperors in history. Zhu Yuanzang, the emperor who established the Ming dynasty almost a thousand years later, praised Yang Jian as a hardworking administrator who properly rewarded meritorious officers. Under him, taxes were reduced and food was in abundance. Personally, he lived a frugal life, and he is one of those rare emperors in history who lived a near monogamous life. He only had physical relationship with his empress Du Gu, who was of Xianbei descent, while she was alive. His only flaws was that he was a micromanager and he often listened to negative gossips about his officials. Things may be looking pretty rosy in the Sui dynasty, but if we were to zoom out and look at the bigger picture, there were actually a few grave external threats that they had to contend with. The first one is the rising power of Goguryeo Korea and the other one is the colossal Gokter Kaganet. The Eastern Kaganet to be precise, because they had split into two. They are especially hostile towards the Sui dynasty for their overthrow of the Northern Zhou dynasty, because the wife of their Kagan was a princess of Northern Zhou. With Yang Jian on the helm, the Sui dynasty was able to astutely neutralize the Gokturk threat by bribing their officials and destabilizing them. But his first war against the Goguryeo ended in defeat. This will be a sore point for the Sui, and their repeated loss to Goguryeo will be one of the catalysts for the rise of the Tang Dynasty. In a way, you could say that Korea played an important part in the creation of China's Golden Age. And you will know the details in the next episode, when I will cover the rise of the Tang Dynasty. So subscribe to the channel if you don't want to miss it. If you would like to participate in the discussion and vote on future topics, be a pro and join us on Patreon. You can also help the channel by liking, sharing, and commenting because it boosts the algorithm. Until next time, stay cool my bros.